everyone needs to understand one thing that you have to develop a logical hypothesis for something if you are following social media and youtube and all you every day hear of a second person who's you know gone big and you know is making a lot of money so i'm wondering where are those nine traders who are losing money because everyone you see is that one trader who's making money so lex this isn't for you so if you have 10 lakh rupees in your demat account your loss cannot be 1 crore the solution starts with your own mind so we talk about 100% returns in a year 200% in a year and here we are talking about modest 25% these are all just scams just stay away from them a bunch of people who made 95% of their net worth just by speaking on youtube and selling their courses which actually do not make money Today we are in conversation with a prop desk trader. He's been trading for ten plus years. Uh, he's Dawal Guardia from Mumbai. Hi, Dawal. Hi. Thanks for having me on the show. So, just tell me one thing: what exactly is a prop desk, and how different is it from an institution, or it is an institution, or it's a brokerage firm? Because the general perception that people have is that prop desk is like a brokerage firm where people trade. So, just just you know, give us an insight into that. Okay. So the thing is, trading is broadly divided into. two portions one is between retail traders and other is between the institutions so prop desk is basically an institution which has a huge asset under management so as far as prop desks are concerned they trade in huge quantities uh and the difference is that they have a huge leverage over retail traders in terms of uh algorithms and cutting edge technology and uh, entry exit so the bid ask sp- spreads So then, uh, do prop desks have their own funds which they trade on, or they've raised funds from the market? Like, uh, if there's a brokerage firm, there are people who are having their accounts there, and then you know they are trading via the brokerage firm. So this prop desk doesn't entertain clients; like it has its own money, and then they trade. That's how it is. It it goes both ways. So, uh, asset management company may have H and I, U H and I clients, and they may have their own funds to trade through. Okay. So tell me about your journey. How did you think about getting into a prop desk? For how long did you trade before you got into a prop desk? And why not? For the first question that most people will have is why not equity and why derivatives? Like what? What exactly made you go towards derivatives? Okay, so the thing is, in my undergraduate degree, where I studied a lot of finance and marketing, so that's where I got in touch with uh, derivatives. And it was firstly, it was uh, quite uh, entertaining too. since it was very different from the normal uh, cash market where you it gives you a kick derivatives yeah sure yeah so uh, whereas you know uh, equity trading or investing is more of like you have uh, uh, analyzed stay in the long game for a longer term yeah yes whereas this is been like an everyday journey you analyze data then put in trades generate returns and then exit so this becomes like an everyday business correct kind of thing So for how long did you trade individually before you got into a prop desk? How many years? Individually as a retail trader, I have traded for almost one and a half to two years uh, prior to shifting into an institution. And for those one and a half to two years that you traded, you saw good results, you felt and that's why you thought of see because there are two ways. Uh, one thing is that people get very good results and they feel that you know if I go to a prop desk I'll do it, you know, better for myself. And the other way to look at it is, if they are not doing that well, they feel by joining a prop test they get an edge over other people. So which which one of the two was it? For me, it was a uh, more of like, you know, I wanted this as a career. When I made it uh, for one and a half years, two years into the retail, I had decided that I wanted to do it, take it up as a career. So that's when, after finishing my post graduation, I decided. to join an institution where i would you know gen- uh, gen- uh, manage more funds and generate returns so and trading as a retail and my journey as a retail trader made me realize that you need to have a cutting edge technology and algorithms to to have an edge over the general public which is trading otherwise you are just one of them so you want didn't want to be one of them you wanted to go a little you know about that so how much how much funds does a you know uh, in terms of you know figures if we talk how, how much does your prop desk firm manage and how much do you individually manage in that okay so as far as the institution is concerned it is managing over 500 cr and on a personal level i am managing 50 cr so then uh 
as far as the trading psychology goes, is it anything different that the way a prop desk trader thinks to a retail trader or is the technology which gives you an edge? Otherwise, psychology-wise, there's not much of a difference. There is a huge difference in terms of psychology as there is a big money at play here. Right. So whenever a profit or a loss happens, either of them are huge. Mm. So uh, there is a huge difference in psychology. And obviously, this is a game of psychology. So psychology is always at play. So, uh, yes, algorithm does give you an edge. Uh, there is no uh, denying that. But yes, there is a psychology at play. So for which you have to have a better uh, quantitative uh, analysis over the data. Okay. Tell me if a layman, if a normal person needs taken up trading and he feels that, you know, he wants to get into a prop desk, he wants to join a prop desk, what path should he follow? What can he do? Because a lot of people, for some reason, I don't know if proprietary desks are, you know, hidden or, you know, it's a secret where they are. Because even if you type on Google, you don't find many results. So if someone wants to know where a prop desk is, how they can join it, what's the way? How to find out? Do you know, have to know people who know of, of prop desk? What's, what's the process? Simplest of the procedure is to do a post-graduation from a very good college where you would directly get into entry into a very big institution. So Okay, but someone who's past that age or past that time and you know they still feel they have it in them because see, I mean degrees and education is very important but it doesn't you know mean that someone who doesn't have that education may not have it in him to be a good trader, right? So if he's at that stage where he is a good trader and he's generating, if, if there's a good return he's generating for himself, there is no reason why he can't do it for a bigger capital for a prop disc. So how is it, he, or, or you are saying that if your results are very good, then it's the prop test that will find you. Is it like that or? Uh, no, then uh, the simplest of the path is that you find some h &I clients and get into some kind of a arrangement in terms of uh, how to share the profits and stuff and, and then, then go about it. You that start be, from there and then you reach a level where, you know, uh, you get in touch with a proprietary desk or something like that happens. So, basically, prop desk is just where, you know, a company where a lot of uh, H&Is and UH and i clients have invested their funds. So, in fact, if if you look at it another way, if you grow bigger and if you, if you have that kind of capital, even, you know, anyone can start a prop desk, you know, I mean, there are big figures involved in it, but there is no compulsion, there's no one stopping you from doing it, right? Right. Okay, so the take from what Dawal is saying is that, you know, you can join a prop desk if you find one or you become so big that you are a prop desk owner and people come and join you. So either way, you know, whatever you want to do. The next thing that I want to come to is that, you know, in India, the th broadly, the, you know, whenever you say that you are a trader or you're an investor, it's the perception is that you are doing something in the stock market. Now, stock market is looked at as a whole. But, you know, we as traders, you know, realize that, you know, there are a lot of different skill sets required depending on what you're doing in the market. For example, if you're an investor, then you need, uh, you know, like fundamental analysis, you need to have, know the financial ratios, like the P ratios and all those things, you know, uh, the revenue that the company is generating and all those things. For that, you need to be data driven. And if you're a trader, especially a short term trader, like if you hold on to a position, say for five days, 10 days, and you book profits and come out, then you need to be a technical analyst, or you need to have, you know, like directional bias. So that's like, those are the different kinds of skill set, you know, whether you are data driven or whether you are a math person, you know, who knows his, you know, uh, you know, numbers very well. It's it's all a number game if, if you are a technical analyst, right? So that's the skill we want to touch upon. So if, if someone is investing, does he need to, you know, listen to a lot of noise or he just needs to do the fundamental analysis and then stick to that company and usually a large cap or a good company, you know, which you've invested in over a period of year, you know, time, is going to give you decent returns. That's what we've seen. If you invest like diversified in 15, 20 different companies, it's impossible for you to not get 12, 13 percent, you know, CAGR. So would you say that's true? That's true. So as far as, uh, oh, but again, the difference is uh, that would become more of like investing. Yeah. Right. Whereas you've invested in a growing mm -hmm. company yeah. uh, or a startup kind of a growing company. And uh, then you have to wait for a period of two years, three years. Whereas trading more of is like an everyday business that you have. Correct. You have uh, intraday trades where you have uh, positional trades, which are just two, three days, four days. So again, if you want to make it a full-time thing, then you choose trading because this is not something you, uh, this is something you do on everyday basis. This is not something you do as a secondary thing. So as far as investing is concerned, if you are doing something else, if you have a full-time job or if you have another business that you're running, you can still be an investor. 
you can do probably an SIP as most people by now should be knowing what SIPs are. You put in a mutual fund, you put it in like, you know, shortlisted stocks and you invest a particular amount every month. That's how you can do it. And if you are a trader, now that's a different game altogether. Because if you are a trader, see, the problem is that you cannot be a part-time trader in the sense that you would be having a lot of time when you are free and you could be doing something else. But in your mind, your mind is always, you know, thinking about what your trade is doing, what what's your next trade going to be. How, how are you going to manage this? So if, if you are doing two, three things at the same time, trading can be really difficult because the skin set required for trading is, you know, depends. Now, trading can be further classified into different things and all of those may de require different skin set. For example, if you are trading in the equity cash market, okay, then again, you know, you are worried about you invest in a stock because in cash market, you can't short sell. That's for derivatives. So if you are going, you can only go long basically in the cash market. So if you're going long, so that means you need a prediction whether a particular uh, script, uh, you know, is going to go up or not. And for that, you need to be a technical analyst. Now, in that you have intraday as well and positional. But I suppose if you, if you are in the equity, you know, cash market, then you wouldn't be doing intraday. I mean, you don't generally do in cash market, you will have to uh, get the entire sum of money. So that you would hold on to for a period of time. So for that, you require technical analysis skill. But as far as uh, trading futures and options is concerned that would require you know a completely different kind of skill set you need to be a good money manager as well because there are margins required then you need to have some cash margin nowadays so you manage that so uh, we sp uh, specifically want to talk about option trading because that's what we both of us do and you know the thing we are going to talk about here is that first of all we would encourage people who don't have a capital or don't have a huge capital to not trade derivatives you know specifically because if you are an option buyer uh, the probability is like very low and the probability of burning your entire capital is very high. So you need to do it at your own discretion. But if you have like 25 lakhs and above, then you can sell options, you would say, or more than yes. 25 lakhs. So would... this is by far, since we have touched this topic, uh, option selling is not for people who have funds in the range of 2 lakhs to 10 lakhs. So because uh, even let's assume your trade goes against you, you would need some amount of margin money to manage for it. So as far as uh, trading options is concerned, at least have a decent capital of over and above 15 lakhs so that you can stay in the trade once, even if it goes against you. So my personal advice is people having a capital of 2 lakhs and 5 lakhs, this isn't for you. Correct. You know, off lately, the moment you log into your broker app, Sebi has come up with, a, you know, I think last, last three, four months, six months, they started where they show a disclaimer that nine out of 10 derivative traders are losing money. Now, it was a little bit of a shock for me because, you know, if you're following social media and YouTube and all, you every day hear of a second person who's, you know, gone big and, you know, is making a lot of money. So I'm wondering where are those nine traders who are losing money because everyone you see is that one trader who's making money. So either the data is wrong, which it cannot be because Sebi is releasing it. So obviously, you know, there are a lot of people who are losing money. Now, I know a lot of friends who are into the derivatives, okay, and they are trading on a decent amount of capital, but they find it very difficult to make money. So the reason is that as we have discussed this before, that, you know, making 20 to 25 percent on your capital should be fairly, uh, I wouldn't say risk free, but minimum risk and, you know, like, you can make it without stress free. So why is it that people struggle to even make that 25% if it's, you know, not that difficult? Why is it? Uh, one of the things is uh, perception of returns that people somehow, uh, I feel, look at the social media and have a perception that you can easily make 80 to 100% returns a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would really like to throw some light on it. That's like utterly nonsense. Nobody makes 100% returns a year on either buying options or selling options. So, you know, people coming up with a perception that, you know, we just put in like some money and double our money every few months, yeah. that's never going to happen. So you will make money once you have a fair, reasonable expectation of returns. So, you know, I would like to uh, say that, you know, expect a decent 2% a month and you will not be disappointed. Expect 8% a month and you may never reach there. So. You might lose what you have yeah, because you are taking that much more risk. So I think what you are saying is that trading uh, is just like any other business. Like if you are running a business, you don't think about doubling your capital or doubling your assets every few months, right? But why suddenly when you are trading, you think about that? So the perception is that trading is like gambling. 
you come here and you know you know make it into five into ten in a short span of time and you take your money and go. First of all, if you make it into five into ten, you don't go away because now you want to make it for the you know into ten into five. So problem is that the probability is so low that you know once or twice you're going to fail and that time everything that you made is going to go. Everything is wiped. So ultimately you come down to you know square one. So trading is not you know uh, necessarily a uh, you know lottery ticket where you are you know you're going to come and you know multiply your capital. So if you treat as treat it just like any other business. then i think you can trade so it's the wrong expectations or the wrong perception of the market that is make you know making people uh, you know uh, lose their money or you know like take some extravagant decisions and because of which their trades go wrong so that's what it is yes, right yes exactly the perception of returns is the only thing that will keep you in this business or throw you out of the business that's the that's the only psychological part that people need to keep in mind before trading before putting in money so the value you spoke about you know generating about 25% in a year on your capital so can you elaborate a bit like what what are the certain you know trading systems you can have you know where you can generate something around 20 25% how how can one do that so it's either you trading uh, derivatives on your own with your own funds or you have a specific portfolio against which you are writing off the pledge yes pledging and writing off the uh, options so there are two things you can do and with the current rules that are going on that specific amount of cash that one needs to have the lot how to yes so i personally think many people have uh, at least 15 20% cash on their portfolio so that would be suffice to you know have uh, writing options that would just make it uh, okay for people to write uh, and uh, I suppose I assume that a normal portfolio returns at least like a twelve to fifteen percent a year, at least a twelve percent returns a year. So then again, getting options, uh, futures option returns to eighteen percent a year would anyways make your portfolio up by twenty five to thirty percent a year. So this is just the basic stuff. Mm-hmm. And then as far as option strategies are concerned, there is. See, so sorry to interrupt one thing i just want to make it clear see first of all we've already told our viewers that you know unless you have a certain amount of capital uh derivative especially options is not for you so that discussion has already been spoken of the other thing i want to speak on is you know like if we come up to the margin rules you know if say someone has a portfolio of for example 30 lakhs okay now he wants to trade options so now there is a 50% cash margin rule that if you don't maintain 50% cash margin then you are charged interest by the broker and most of them charge say about uh, you know 0.05 percent a day which translates to 18 percent a year if you are having a trade you constantly trade every single day so taking that into consideration if you need to have 15 lakhs as cash now it might not be practical to have you know 15 lakhs cash 50 percent all the time so as you said 15 20 percent so let's assume that one doesn't have cash or one has about 20 percent cash in their account so 30 lakhs even require 15 lakhs cash but you just have 6 lakhs cash So then, about nine lakhs is what you know on where what you'll be paying interest. So around eighteen percent on nine uh, lakhs is you know close to what does the figure come up to? If you take about twenty percent, eighteen percent on nine lakhs, that's two lakhs a year is what you pay as interest. So that's like one of your expenses apart from brokerages and all those things. So now after that expense, which is about eight percent on the entire capital, two lakhs on thirty lakhs is eight percent. So eight percent on the entire capital. So now if you say twenty five percent, you need to make around thirty thirty two percent. or even if you make say 27 28 percent still net you take home 20 percent which is good enough so now you know if you are pledging your portfolio and writing you know options just uh, you know tell us certain trading systems which you know people can follow and see just ideas we are not here to you know discuss a 925 straddle or a 930 strangle and all that all that you know you have enough videos on youtube for people to do that but that doesn't really make sense because what they do is they generally back test and forward test certain strategies and wherever you know at a particular time they find a good result they just post it that this but they don't realize that you know one or two good days you know in that results will show a huge profit when you run it for over a year so those kind of back tests don't really make sense so what what are certain ideas that you know you have you know for our viewers whether they are intraday or positional if you can share it with us how how can you trade see there are uh, if, if you go and read at least a book on options trading there are a lot of strategies that they have discussed but again they are all book strategies and they'll make sense for you once you implement them right so basically for what has worked for me over the span of 10 years is there are two things one is keep a track of uh, straddles and trade straddles and strangles 
and the other ones being if you have a directional bias on the trade on your underlying if you have a directional bias you may go for debit spread mm -hmm. where you have a specific amount of uh, loss defined you don't have undefined uh, loss on the, any trade so my take on the entire thing is you can never have a trade which has undefined losses whereas as, as i spoke about straddles so you can trade straddles with a fixed stop loss in intraday or if you want to keep the trade for at least two days you make it an iron butterfly okay so you start off with a straddle you're saying on a particular day and then uh, it's a naked straddle and towards the end of the day you convert into iron butterfly is that yeah. what you're saying okay and then you hold on to the trade for how long once you convert to iron butterfly you do it one day before the expiry yes. or you do it every day probably just two days one or two days not more because since it's a it's a straddle you know market if it moves around it is bound to change the strikes so either you change the strikes or you cut the trade with a specific amount of profit that you got oh you got a percentage on your capital that if i make this much then i exit the there is 125% 130% on one trade even if we are generating 0.20% return on one trade i think that's just good enough so i think uh, from what we know already and what you know, what we want to talk about is that for option sellers or you know uh, most of the option sellers are trading throughout the year because if you see the market like it's flat throughout the year with certain days when the market runs right so if there are like 250 or 220 trading days it's not that 220 days the market is misbehaving otherwise you would see the market 50 70% up every year this doesn't happen right so the market is just doing time pass as the same normal you know trading line it's doing time pass this way and then there are certain you know days when it spikes and then there's a bullish you know this thing break out and then it goes there and then it reaches the stage where it has to only thing is we don't know where that stage is where it's going to stop and then it again starts doing this So, would you say that for the option seller, it's only those days when the market goes against him or the trades that go bad, he needs to manage that and reduce the losses because in the on the other days he's anyway going to make money. So, would you say that because the probability of an option seller is much higher of making money because uh, you know most calls and puts are going to end up you know out of the money whether it's on expiry or before that, and they're going to give you theta decay. So, would you say that it's the bad trades that they need to manage, and the good trades are anyway going to give them money? So, if you lose like as less as possible on the bad trades, then you automatically have a good, you know, return score. Would you say that? Yeah, that's probably yes, correct. Uh, the thing is, uh, like you said, the thing about options is the beauty, beautiful part about trading options is that you can make money even when the markets are sideways, and you can make money even when. market is taking a specific direction either downside or upside and the secondary thing so you know simple thing is uh my take on the thing is people need to be aware of the price action that is going on in the market even if you trading certain uh, stocks i mean say or an index you need to be aware of the price action that is what is going to uh, make you enter a trade yeah. right so knowing the trend i am totally not talking about the indicators but just a simple price action should you should have a clear thought in your mind whether the market is trending or is sideways yeah. because option is going to make you money both ways but then you need to have a clear picture what the market is doing because at the end you're just trading the underlying right whether you're trading the equity or a futures or an option so you firstly my, uh, my analysis says that you need to have a clear view sideways or trending and the second part is when the market is breaking out from a certain levels on a downside upside you need to cut down on the short trades so either you take a directional trade if you are too sure of the direction and you comfortable with a debit spread then you take a directional trade or if you are just uh, an extreme uh option seller and if you do not want to have a option buy trade then you just sit on the side sidelines and just do nothing when the market is trending correct so i think that is also one of the most difficult things and you know sometimes people are so used to being in the trade that they can't see their you know app which is not having any trades like they just want to be in the trade for some reason so no, knowing when to not trade is as important or probably more important than knowing when to trade because price action also for option sellers a lot of them think that the market is sideways so indicators are not necessary in fact i would say it's the opposite that if price action is the most underrated indicator for option selling because 
if you can get that support resistance and that breakout clear, you can easily, you know, cut down on the loss making trades as you said. That if I'm seeing that there is a uh, clear breakout on the bullish side, like there is a two month, three month resistance that's been broken and the market's trending like it is right now, then I've got to be a fool to be writing calls aggressively, right? Yeah. So if even if I want to do something, I at least know. See, for our option seller, this is the advantage. If the market break it breaks out and goes up directionally, then we make money. Or even if it stays there, we still make money if you're shorting puts. Yes. For a person who's, you know, like going long, if he buys a call or he buys future, he only makes money if the market moves up drastically. But for an option seller, if I'm, you know, writing in the opposite direction, like if I'm writing a put, let the market stay there and, you know, not do anything. Right. Because once a breakout comes, it's possible that the breakout doesn't stay. But it's very rare that the breakout goes in the opposite direction. That only happens with a news or an event. So guys, when you see a clear breakout on the upside or the downside, the easiest thing to do is, you know, rather than going your iron condor or, you know, both sides or iron butterfly, just be on one side. If you see a bullish breakout, like there is one right now, you can try puts, you can buy a hedge, you know, of one strike price lower or whichever you want to manage it, you can do ratios. I mean, we don't really encourage naked, but, you know, people who are doing it for years, they do naked writing as well. So you can write a naked, probably a uh, furnace to fire ratio, you can write a naked put and, you know, probably buy, you know, like if you've written 10 puts, you can buy, you know, one or three or four, you know, like in the money. And write the naked one a little out of the money. You can do those ratios where then things like those. So that's done. And you know, uh, positional as far as positional goes, or do you have anything you know specific that you can share? You know, what can we follow? Like I said, uh, you have to have a data which clear, which uh, gets you a clear picture as to what straddle should be on what days. Yeah. Okay. So. If you don't have that, then I don't think your trades would make sense or they would make sense probably if you're writing too much out of the money mm. where it's even, you know, short spikes or short mm. movements then in the market. Then risk reward is going to get spoiled because if you're going too out of the money, you're getting 10 rupees, 15 rupees each side and when you're losing that 15 becomes 70, 80. So the risk reward is bad. Yes, exactly. So for that, you need to have a very well-defined uh, support resistance level. Once it breaks out of certain levels, you may have at the money short or you may have far OTM short. You need to cut them. Like I said, you see a market trending either due to a news or due to a normal breakout, whatever the case may be. You need to have a specific price action levels before entering the trade because that's the only thing that would keep you in the trade. And otherwise, just, you know, in option trading, you can wipe out your capital just like... In a few in, days. Yes. This... Yeah. A month's time or whatever. What's a good risk reward according to you if for someone who's doing trading option selling? What's a good risk My reward? My take on risk reward in options trading is a little different from cash market because I have seen people uh, saying that you need to have a risk reward of three is to one. But honestly, that does not work in options trading. You know, having a risk reward of one is to one is a good thing. You can't go be below one is to one because then you are being foolish. You know, if you go no Is anyone one, telling you you need to have a 3 is to 1 risk reward ratio that in options trading that won't work. You 3 is to 1 and 3 reward and 1 risk is what? So you can't do that. I mean, how can you never have that? I'm only going to lose 100, but I want 300. Yeah. It doesn't happen. Yeah, it doesn't happen. Correct. So, uh, what you, the strategy that you earlier spoke, spoke about the iron butterfly, and then I mean, first the straddle and that goes to the iron butterfly, that is more of an extension of an intraday trade. If someone yes. wants to trade for 8 days, 10 days, see, there were iron condors which were, you know, very like each and every person who's traded at some point knows what an iron condor is. Right now, we hear a lot of new names, but you don't hear about the iron condors, you know, or things like those. So, have iron condors stopped working? It's the risk reward that is not that great, or what's exactly happened? What are people doing? Well, the thing is, uh, people trading iron condors, from my experience, do not know either when to enter and when to exit. Mm. And the second part is they do not know how to manage them. This is because it, it's just not like you've just entered the trade and you're going to exit the trade. There is in between if the market moves around, there are times when you have to manage the trades by changing the strikes, mm. uh, increasing your position size, decreasing your position size. Those are the things that I think a lot of people are just missing out on. Mm -hmm. uh, so because like I said, it's it becomes like an everyday business. It's not like stock where you just enter once and then you exit once, done. This is not that. You need to repair many positions. There are a lot of times uh, it happens that, you know, you've entered the trade and right away the trade is into losses. Mm -hmm. So you need to learn how to repair those trades and come out of a loss-making position. So, 
iron condor iron butterflies they work mm-hmm. but it's just that uh, people need to know about position sizes increasing decreasing changing the strikes and the managing the whole stuff that will get you towards a decent return so i have you know something that i take and you know currently is like you know calendar spreads so when i do calendar spreads what i do is that you know i trade by monthly because nowadays like of late if you've seen the premiums have become so bad now again the wicks is going up a bit so the premiums are coming back but the premiums have become so bad that if you're trading like on a weekly expiry there's nothing if you go out of the money for 10 rupees to rupees i mean there is nothing you are in this too near, near yeah they are too near so you feel that you know you already taking or starting off the trade forget the risk reward that's going to happen as a result of that you already feel in that risk in the beginning so what i have you know thought that it works and see the one thing you need to understand that there is no one magic strategy that keeps working throughout your life and like just like a human being has different requirements at different points in life similarly the market has you know different requirements in terms of how you trade it you know so if the wicks is too low then you have to have a different trading strategy if the wicks is at a you know a medium level then you need to have a different kind of mindset and when the wicks is high you have no premium so you can trade it differently so as of now currently what you know you basically look for strategies that work for a longer period of time you don't want to make too many changes and keep tweaking it because you see a retailer doesn't have you know access to a lot of your softwares that you prop this guys have like the algorithms and you know the data coming faster to them and all those things they have a normal broker app maybe nowadays someone has got a basic algo software to you know punch in their trades you know but this still it's like a manual software which helps you, you know punch your trade more efficiently so for them you know they need to have that kind of a you know strategy which is simple to understand and simple to execute so as far as calendar goes you know uh, i i want your opinion on that as well since you are a prop desk trader you know how you see this retailers you know strategy so i go by weekly i mean by monthly i do take the trade twice in a month and if i've got the profits in the first trade like in 3 4 days then it might become three trades in a month so what i do is i don't go for the you know next like immediate expiry if i'm doing say trade on a monday for example i send the option for the next thursday like i would go for around 25 rupees yeah next week so if i'm trading on monday i would not send this thursday's options i would send it for next thursday what i was do it uh, what how i would do it is you know i would send like 25 rupees options for the Oh, uh, next Thursday for call and put in both. I go premium wise because you know VIX keeps going up and down, so strike price is two hundred three hundred points away. It's complicated, so you go options. You know premium wise twenty five rupees. It will generally be around four hundred points away or five hundred points away, or probably even more because you are going next week. And then you sell two of them, and then uh, what you do is you know the expiry after that, the Thursday after the one that you sold, the Thursday after that you buy the two options of around. 35 rupees you know 32 35 rupees you know uh, uh, whatever strike price it is so on paper it's a debit spread but it's not exactly a debit spread because when your sold options expire that the, the ones that you bought are still a week away so they will have some value right yes so your the chart that is made is you know it's it's like this it it, it goes like this and you know it, there are like two points where the profit increases on either side and then there is a small red in the center mm-hmm. where there is a loss now the only thing in this trade to do is that manage that red part and it it should be having minimum adjustments if the market behaves like it behaves most of the year we are not talking about an unforeseen circumstance right now we we'll come to that later so what you do here is you know as you get closer to the expiry you see the moment in the market there are two things that can happen either the market moves or it stays flat now in terms of how it moves we take up a moment of around 100 to 150 points in the initial days when you just initiated the trade a moment of 150 points either way then then be an adjustment to make and so if there is the market moves on the upper side for 150 points then you simply get the put a little closer and what are you what i mean by saying an in closer is that 25 rupees that you sold would have become say 20 rupees 13 rupees because of the dk and the market move so you square off that and you move that put to the new 25 rupees one that is going on and similarly the bot put would have decayed as well you you, know, you square off that and you get it closer now you continue this exercise you know how you know as many times the market moves about 150 points and as you come say closer to the expiry make that 150 points 100 points say like you initiated the trade on a monday did friday you made a couple of adjustments now the next monday you are in the trade and the market moves for 100 points you can make the same adjustment because now there are just 3 days left for expiry right and in this trade what i have seen is you carry on till your adjustments till the maximum monday or you know tuesday like just two days before the expiry because beyond that whatever adjustment you make it doesn't work because you've already come so close you know to atm that after that any moment that the market makes you it's going to give you a loss 
and here I try to get a risk reward of one is to one. Sometimes, you know, if the premiums are high, if the fix is high, I aim for, you know, 1.5 is to one. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm talking about percentage. So if I'm getting, taking a 1.5% loss, I exit the trade irrespective of what is where, where the market is. And if I'm getting a 1.5 to 2% profit, I exit the trade irrespective of what happens, right? Now, in between this, if you have a news or you know, there is some budget or something, now you initiated the trade and there was an RBI, RBI policy which you are not aware of, which you feel is going to make the market move in that kind of a situation, you can take a call whether you want to stay in the trade or not. But generally, this, if you do this over like say 10 trades, 20 trades, that has worked 75, 80% of the time. So you have to be prepared for, you know, like if you take 20 trades, you know, probably eight are, yeah, yeah, yeah. So out of 10, say seven make money, seven times you make, you know, 2%, that's, that's 14%. And three times you lose, you know, four and a half percent. So that's ten percent in like ten trades. And this, this you can probably have twenty four trades at least in a year. So that goes to twenty five percent, right? So I mean, this is one of the ideas that I can share right now. Then there are ratio spreads as well. You know, you can buy probably ATM calls and puts, and then you know sell probably five or seven or ten out of the money. Now we generally don't want to promote this, you know, to viewers because this is naked selling, right? At the end of the day. But here you need to know how to manage it. So people with, you know, like a bigger capital would be knowing how to manage it. So probably they can, you know, explore these options. Also now here, since we spoke about the risk reward and obviously when we, I trade, you know, our stop loss is more based on the, you know, percentage of capital rather than individual stop losses. Because as an individual trader, if you're putting your stop losses in the broker account, there is stop loss hunting that happens, you know, there are spikes that happen. It's very difficult. You cannot have a, you know, strike price wise stop loss. I don't think so. It's at least for me, it doesn't work. Also in positioning trend, it's irrelevant to have a stop loss at a broker because every day you're going to put in the stop loss in the money. What happens if the market opens gap up or gap down? So stop loss anyway, hit right. So uh, in a positional trade, I think a capital wise stop loss works. And secondly, since we are talking about the target profit and stop loss and all those things, we come to the trading psychology. Okay, now a lot of people talk about discipline in the trades and, you know, sticking to your stop losses and all those things. But how do you define trading psychology? What exactly is trading psychology for you and how much of a role does, you know, how your mindset is plays in trading? So, it is mostly a game of psychology, right? So, you know, but you know, what tends to happen with people is the, their emotions just get very best of them. And I've seen people cutting the trade even when they knew what their defined losses were. Even and while entering the trade, a person knows their defined set of loss is just 10,000. Uh, and they just see some news and, you know, and they speak to some other people and they just flip their positions. But why? When you know what your defined losses are. So, you know, uh, either it, for this purpose itself, you need to only have a strategy where you have a defined set of stop losses. Even if the market was to just go up by 500%, uh, 500 points, up or down, you know your loss is just 10k or 20k or 50k, whatever your position size is. So once you have that, you know, you that emotion part just goes away. Mm -hmm. So and when your emotion part goes away, you know, your trading gets better in a way that you know, your emotions are just not interfering with you on a constant basis. Mm -hmm. You you can't have a spiraling mind and then make shit in, very big money. So, you know, you know, that stability of the mind is the only thing that's going to keep you in the trade and making money. Yeah. So, my take on the whole thing is have a defined set of stop loss and stick with the trade. Stick with your own analysis. Just don't flip the positions based on some piece of news that you hear, yeah, some piece of news you hear from someone. Just don't keep flipping the positions. See, if you have a genuine piece of news that you heard and then you are exiting the trade, that is understandable. But just that, you know, Every single person. Oh. But does that genuine piece of news reach the retail trader? <laughs> <laughs> Sooner or later it does, but... But I think it's too late for him, you know, by the time it reaches him. So, I think what you said initially that if you have your set parameters of entering and exiting a trade, just stick to that. So that, you know, that observation that I had is, you know, for an option seller especially, what happens is that, you know, uh, he he's going to, the probability of, you know, the, the strike rate of the trade is very high. So if he's taking 10 trades, he's succeeding in 7 or 8. So his trading, the test of his trading psychology only happens twice or thrice on, in those, on those bad trades. And when he loses big on those bad trades, the trades that he won and become irrelevant because you end up, you know, losing on the bad trades. 
So because the test of the trading psychology opens up only only happens 20-30% of the time, the practice of that is not much. You know, he only knows how you know the psychology works when he's in the trade. Before taking the trade, there's no pressure on you. So you note down, you make those notes. You know, a lot of people have those, you know, presentations and all those things where they said that this is how I'll enter the trade, this is how I'll exit the trade. So the most important thing here is that when you have a fixed stop loss there and a fixed, you know, uh, target profit there. Then why are you touching your trade until any pa- any of those parameters to exit are not met, right? So if if I think what happens is initially when you initiate the trade and with an option seller it can happen quite frequently that this theta DK market is not doing much. He's already seen 0.2% or you know 50-70% of the profit that he targets in the first two three days. So the mind starts calculating that I'm making 1.5% on this trade and then his already mind is already on the next trade that how well this trade is working and I can keep doing this. So the mind is already prepared for that 1.5% profit. And then three days, four days, five days pass away, and then nothing's happening. Market is flat. So now it's it's like his, his sixth sense, his instinct has already told him that this profit cannot close in a loss. Mm-hmm. We all know that you know there is nothing impossible in the market, but quite you know clearly the mind has created an illusion for itself that this trade cannot close in a loss. Now then what happens? There is a gap up, gap down. Next day, there is an M to M swing. M to M from you know like green, like good one percent or 0.7 percent is showing you zero, or it's now started going into red. Now the mind is in shock that I was expecting a 1% or a 1.5% profit, but this exact the same trade is going into losses. How do I manage this? Now th- there is that shock reaction that happens that in his mind, he's actually in 1.5% loss because he had seen that 1.5% profit. But the pra- parameters are telling him that you don't touch it till it's 1.5% loss. Okay, because in how many times have we seen that there is a swing, the market end to end goes from green to red and then it again settles down. It sends down. And so no one's talking about you're waiting here indefinitely like a fool. But unless and until the exit parameters are not met, why do you need to touch the trade? So, you know, here I would like to bring in a cricket analogy that, you know, uh, we all follow cricket. So MS Dhoni keeps saying that, you know, follow the processes, the results would, fo- would follow, right? Yeah. So when the trade is going against you, you go through the sheet or go through the notes that you had made and, you know, just look at the parameters. If you want, just keep putting a tick. Are the exit parameters being met? Is the stop loss being hit? If the answer is no, don't touch the trade. Are the tar- is the target profit being made? You know, is the answer is no, don't touch the trade. Is is the index moved by 200%, like one of the parameters for adjustments? If no, then don't touch the trade. Okay, if there is a movement of 200%, there is a requirement for an adjustment, I'll only make an adjustment. Yeah. I'll not square off the trade. Yeah. So I think this is what trading psychology actually means, which, you know, most people don't talk about. They talk about strategies, they talk about stop losses, they talk about discipline. But what all of this in totality means is tra- what trading psychology is, right? Yeah. So we've already spoken there were quite a few things about the equity market, about options and about trading psychology and all those things. One more thing I want to touch upon is the uh, general perception that the public has about stock market that, you know, just to talk in pure layman's language, you know, you can like lose your house, you can lose a lot of money and all those things. So initially in the 90s, like uh, we would be probably growing up at that time. We used to hear, you know, our parents talk about three, you know, putting their house on mortgage or, you know, selling their houses off to pay off debts and all. Off lately, I mean, at least what I have noticed, there are a lot more people, you know, a lot more DMATs about DMAT accounts that have opened. But you don't notice, you know, people talking about people losing their homes and, you know, owning a lot of money. You hear about losses here and there, but you don't about, you know, you hear about people losing their capital or, you know, like losing everything that they have. So what has changed? Like, can you just tell us what has changed? I, the awareness thing that people earlier did not have awareness about uh, where to cut losses uh, in where to go to stop loss, uh, the hedging, hmm. hedging stuff that people earlier did not know anything about. I'm specifically talking about how SEBI, what's the framework that SEBI has done. Broadly speaking, that it's easy for people to understand what was it then that was different than what is it now that you know doesn't let you make certain kind of losses or doesn't let you trade more than you know what you have so can you just explain that sevi has uh by bringing in these rules about options in more or less there uh, about uh narratives to these regulations that they have brought in mm. uh they have brought in for derivatives trading not for equity because uh, anyways equity you are not bound to lose more than what you have put it yeah. right so in derivatives if you were to put in certain kind of trades where you do not have uh, protections on the wings, mm. like Iron Condors has, like there are certain credit spreads where you do not have, the, where you have undefined losses, mm. right? So this was the thing where Semi needed to actually step in 
because there were a lot of people who were incurring losses and then you know brokers had a complain of not people not paying or brokers so, suffering that losses as a result of clients not paying yeah all that has changed now we will have very strict norms also pledging initially it used to be that you know a lot of people who held a you know good amount of like in, in portfolio in form of you know stocks as they say and they never touched their stocks never traded but that was being misused to give leverage to someone else all those things have happened in the past we don't want to name that broker but you know one of the huge brokerage houses that scam had come out so everyone knows about it you know so that now you think there is a you know it's impossible or okay you never say impossible but a negligible negligible chance yes because uh, earlier there was also a chance of uh, you know uh, brokers you even misusing trillions fund sure. and you know uh, putting in trades and making money out of it on personal uh, for their own firms so that stands to where cb is brought in regulations for you know uh, wherein the broker cannot access uh, the client's pms bo- the portfolio and use it for the personal uses personal gains so you know that one good regulation that they've brought in and another one in terms of option trading is also where you need to maintain specific amount of money yeah in yeah. terms of cash correct in your uh, portfolio correct. for writing so you know this just gives a and leverage even to the broker where you know they they are they do not have to run behind people in yeah case where they incur losses they do not have to run behind people for correct, like, correct. uh getting the dues back correct so and also another thing that they have done is where you know uh where specifically if people are in let's assume people are trading a strangle uh one lot of strangle would cost you somewhere like 1 lakh to 1 lakh 20 thousand one lot and if you convert the same into an iron condor the margin reduces it, yes the margin reduces and you can trade it for 60 thousand correct so that's like 70% 60% of the total Well, one lakh goes down to sixty thousand. So you know that in a way is even protecting, like that yeah. hedging. We want that. So they they are basically telling you if you are defining your loss, then we are ready to give you leverage. In us, exactly. So, right. So they are making you form good habits, which you yourself probably won't do it. Yeah, yes. Also, one more thing, important thing is that if you remember back in the day, there were not very strict, you know, margin rules, and you know a lot of. times you made a call to the broker if the broker knew you he would buy a stock for you take a position for you and you've not even paid him and you certain you know you just used to play in the difference like i know of a time i i was speaking to someone who was you know in the markets at that time and they said that when we had news about a particular stock we used you know we used to make a call to a broker who used to know you know know us and our family for long enough he used to say that pick 10000 share of you know this script this particular stock He's like, hey, we have five or ten days or fifteen days, you know, as good as fifteen days or even a month sometimes to pay him back. And he said that in between that, if he has seen your profit, we call him and tell him that you send the you know stock. So there is no actually exchange of money or shares that has happened. And he is booking profits for me because when there is a bull bull run going on, you know, everything that you touch is turning to gold. Just imagine you've not paid a single penny, and every month or you know every two months he's coming and giving you some money that this is the profit you made. So we've seen those times. Now imagine at that time people used to, you know, default or you know they used to turn back on their word because that time they used to not even be like proper IVR recording and all those things where you can catch hold of the client that you had told me to buy the stock. And imagine if you make a call to a broker and you say buy the stock, the stock falls by thirty percent, and you, the broker calls you for payment. You say I don't know, I don't want the stock. What does a broker do? The broker used to incur huge losses, and to cover that, some other client of his who's genuine will have to suffer because the money has to come from somewhere, right? so all of those things that nonsense has stopped completely secondly the leverage you know again you know if you knew some broker you know where you have your account for years he used to give you leverage like if you have x he used to let you take a position 10x 20x 50x depending on how when he knew you right now sebi like whoever you are you know when you open an account everything's mostly online if you are trading and if you have like say 50 lakhs or 1 crore in your account as capital you get 80% or 75% after haircut depending on what script you hold and that's the margin you can trade now you could be anyone whether you are a dhawal guwari or rishab shah or rakesh junjunwala the margin remains the same for everyone okay unless you are a prop test trader and you know which have different kind of rules and regulations which which is very well defined so it's important to bring out actually this small segment is specially for those parents you know who feel that you know their child might take up the stock you know stocks or stock market or derivatives and you know lose everything it's it's not possible to lose everything If you have an X amount in your DMAT account, it's virtually impossible to lose more than that. Yes. Right. So if you have ten lakh rupees in your DMAT account, your loss cannot be one crore. It can probably not even be ten lakhs because they only give you eighty percent margin or whatever. Right. 
so it's it's relatively safer in fact i was reading a study recently that's interesting because a uh, lot of us may not know that that worldwide indian stock market right now is the safest or one of the safest markets in the world the kind of norms that we have so in detail i don't know how true is that but they say that from the investors point of view how are the investors protected at times you know seasoned traders like us feel that you know for a little bit of margin requirement we are not allowed to take position and things like those but for the retail trader you know they are actually forming good habits that unless you are hedge so, yeah 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 and now i think so some of the brokers have also come up with one thing that if you've taken leverage and hedge date and could reduce your margin if you have one cr and you've taken like used utilized one cr with along with the hedges now it won't let you square off the hedges unless and until you square off your set position first so you never naked so in that way you're never naked only you first you square off your sell you know sell side on the options and only then you square off your buy side so that's that's one of the things that the market is much safer now than it was 20 years back another thing that you know uh, we initially spoke of is you know the unrealistic expectation and you know unrealistic you know the perception that people have now one of the places where it stems from is the online gurus right now these guys are you know i think what they are blessed with is not the trading acumen i think what they are blessed with is like how when they can speak how when they can fool literally it's that so they talk about 100% returns in a year 200% returns and here we are talking about modest 25% i mean what's this so what are these gurus about and you know how 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 strict has sebi been i i generally have a feeling that you know the whole system has been actually quite lenient to these guys who are actually big who you know think the innocent people for a right well, what's your take on that you know it's from last one decade that youtube's become popular i've been seeing people uh, who i do not wish to name anybody but there are bunch of people who made 95% of their net worth just by by speaking on youtube and selling their courses which actually do not make money for anybody even if he himself was to trade the same strategy that he spoken he is not going to make money so you know i am not here to just uh, pinpoint at anyone but yes i would like to pinpoint at a place where you know just people need to become more aware that you know people online people telling you about 90% returns a year and 100% returns a year just these are all just scams just stay away from them you know have a realistic expectation 25 30% a year you know you you're going to pass by you're going to make decent money you know this this online selling courses double your capital in few days few weeks few months just stay away that's just my piece of advice to everyone yeah so i come across this guy on youtube i mean never in my entire life forget trading in any other business have i seen an expert like that he used to promise you that you know he gives you a certain percentage you know on every trade and he used to give you know fancy names to his strategies which are catchy and which like you know the gullible people who generally fall for it you know because they are looking for quick money right so he used to give guarantees like you know i give you a written guarantee on a stamp paper and things like those that if you don't make money the money comes back to you he used to you know or distribute free gifts if you take up his course and things like those now i think the heights of that and reached when this guy this particular guy again i don't want to name him it's it's not relatively tough to you know get information about him because he he will rank you know on top like if you type one of the youtube scammers you know as far as trading goes uh, it was very much an indian and he said that uh, you know he, there was an uh, advertisement and especially especially it's important for people to know that you cannot uh advertise or market derivative courses and derivative you know uh, selling like it's it's not legal you sebi doesn't allow you to do that that you know first of all sebi calls it that you manage someone's money and you know personally without having any kind of license and you trade in derivatives on you know on behalf of someone that itself is illegal and here this guy is selling a course and he's advertising himself on twitter and that that clip of 20 seconds or 30 seconds that i saw he had managed to advertise that on one of the news channels now it was absolutely shocking that how it made it to you know the news channels here it's a clear case of you know someone in the uh, someone who edits or you know someone who looks after the content probably wasn't aware of the law that you're not allowed to advertise on tv right and he is his advertisement of you know derivative courses you know made it to the television and after that you know there were a few people on twitter who called him out and you know then sebi started taking action and now, now i think uh, i don't know i have not been recently updated with it but he's fighting i mean it's got to court and he's told to refund you know a big amount of money which he had taken right 
So I think that's that's one place where SEBI can be a little more strict. Uh, the exchanges and you know SEBI together they can work. And been doing fantastic job regarding the same. Yeah, we expect them to be much more uh, tough on all these because yeah. you know it's just that people for retail people, you know, losing money not by trading but by just you know following yeah, these people is yeah, what yeah, is yeah, happening. Yeah. So you know, rather than just actual trading and learning something from it, they just. Yeah. Just going some another direction and losing money on all yeah. the me and these people. So yeah. that's I think th- that's where what we spoke about earlier, like you know the trading systems, you know the ideas that we shared. The reason why we are not telling you that buy this or send this or buy this or send that is because tips don't work. Tips is ultimately you are depending on someone else's you know advice or someone else's brain. You need to understand if you want to learn something from someone, you actually pick his brain and try to form your own path, just like the way he did. When he formed this path, the market conditions could be different. His psychology could be different. Your psychology could be different. But the way you have to take inspiration is that if this man can make this path, so can I. I don't have to follow his path. You know, I I cannot tell you you buy this today. I mean, that's my research. That's my study. That's my conviction. Anything you do in life only comes with self belief. If even if whether it's a trade or a stock, suppose if you've taken a trade or you've taken a uh, you know stock. And on your tip, or on you know, by your advice, I invest in the same, or I take the same trade. There is a very high possibility that you come out of it making money, and I lose a big amount of that. The reason being the timing. You might hold on to the trade as per the parameters you are convinced of, and I might not hold on to the trade because it was never my conviction. My conviction was that this guy is giving me a trade and has to make me money. Now somewhere down the line, that conviction wasn't strong enough. So what I did is after three, four, or five days, I did see that you know required amount of profit that I expected. So I think that this state is not going to have to get out of it because there is no study behind it. There is no you know pattern behind it. I don't know how this state is going to behave. He's done that time and again, and he studied that, so he knows how the trade is going to behave. So he's calmly you know carrying on with the trade, and he waits for the right time to see that profit and exit the trade. And I, out of my you know lack of self belief and the conviction, come out of the trade. So the reason why you know tips and you know like following someone blindly or strategies which someone puts out on social media don't work. Is because you have not studied it. It's not your conviction. It's someone else's conviction. Someone else's conviction cannot make you money. So you need to be, you know, you need to make a trading system that works best for you. You need to understand that certain times, you know, short term trades. Like if I have to use an analogy here, like if you use an intraday uh, example, intraday is more like uh, you know, twenty twenty sports or a football match where everything happens quickly. There is not a lot of research you do while you are in the trade. Everything's done beforehand. While as in whereas in positional positional trading, it's more like a you know test match. Like you stay in the position for five days, seven days. Different skill sets are required, you know, for both the things. So you cannot you know overlap the two. So if you feel that you are a calm person, you don't want to look at the screen every now and then. You don't want to be in front of the screen, you know, every day from nine to three. Maybe you don't do intraday. Maybe you get into a positional trade where you need to you know just keep updated about the market every now and then. Like you know just keep an eye on what the market is doing and make adjustments as required. If you are a person who likes, you know, like pace and who likes to, you know, look at the screen, like you know, a lot of traders nowadays do at prop desk and things like those, they're practically trading. If you like that, if you're doing it for the thrill of it, which is not a bad thing, I ain't. You take thrill in, you know, a lot of other things. If you can take thrill and make money, keep it pay to get thrill, you know, the adventure and all those things. If you can make money with thrill. There's nothing bad in that. So you can, you know, uh, do intraday trade this win if whatever works for you. So you cannot follow us, you know, someone because they said this on YouTube or Instagram. So that needs to be cleared. Anything that needs to be followed, you know, from you know following or taking inspiration is that if they can create an own path, then so can I. I don't have to follow their path. That's what then needs to be cleared. And this is that you know, for me, a consistently profitable trader. Yeah. You know, you have to start with the mere fact that. Solutions start with your own mind. Mm-hmm. Solutions to anything start with your own mind. Yeah. So you know, getting into the trade. So you know that simple thing of everyone needs to understand one thing that you have to develop a logical hypothesis for something. Yeah. And then either backtest it. Yeah. With the data or maybe even forward test it for a few days. Yes. Or just trade with very small quantities and try to. Uh, you know, uh, see whether that logical hypothesis is working or you need to add or subtract certain things to it and then go full-fledged with it. So, you know, what's going to make you a consistent trader over time is having your own logical hypothesis behind entry, exits and position size. 
Correct. And that's something that has worked for me over time. Correct. Also, one more thing here is that can be added is that there is one thing is to have data and the other thing is to have experience of how data moves or the changes. So experience of data is especially in option selling. If someone who's traded for a long time or, you know, has, you know, knows how the market moves, you wake him up in the middle of the night and tell him that if the market is at this, how much is going to be the premium of 400 or 500 points away? His answer will be like 10 to 15 percent here and there, but he'll give you a figure. Okay. He'll tell you that if the VIX increases by this much, the premium can spike up by this much. If the market moves by 200 points, the premiums can, you know, spike up by this much. If you don't know all of these things, how do you expect yourself to be a good trader? Like putting in a strategy and thinking that it's going to work. Because when you know, you know, merely just like, you know, six, seven days having patience and observing how the market moves and how the premium prices change. It's tough to do that. But if you do that, and if you do that over a period of time, you just get the pulse of the market. That this is how the market moves. See, the important thing is, it's not always necessary to predict when, where the market will go, mm. but it's necessary to know how the market will move, when it will move, and how, what, the way I am going to react is the market moves a certain way. If you can predict that, that's good enough. You know, what's controllable is your behavior. Yeah. Market is not in your control, but knowing how, how market behaves when it goes out of control is important. Like, for example, Bank Nifty, you know, a lot of times I've tried to trade Bank Nifty. I've not been able to get the pulse of it because the movements are so aggressive, so extreme. Yeah, I'm not. Whereas Nifty, you know, Nifty more or less. Yeah, feel that, yeah, yeah, yeah. You you feel the index doesn't misbehave as much as uh, right. you know Bank Nifty does. So whatever works best for you. A lot of you know a, a few of the people who I know, like some of them are friends. They trade Bank Nifty because they like the wide moves. You know, they they like buy and sell options both. So when they are on the buy side, they feel that Bank Nifty can you know give them like really quick profits. Like if you bought a 300 rupee option. It can go to 370, 380 in like a span of one or two minutes. So right. they like the thrill. I mean, each one to their do Whatever works thing. So that's how it is. So I think we've, uh, you know, spoken about the trading, different trading systems that we can have, trading psychology that, that can be done, you know. One of the things that I felt I missed out while speaking was on covered calls. You know, especially if you have, if you have like uh, some of the things uh, in your portfolio, some of the stocks in your portfolio, which are nifty, nifty 50 stocks and which are also there in SNO. I think uh, covered calls can be a really good strategy. It's for a traditional, you know, like conventional minded person who doesn't want to take risk, who doesn't want to do too many adjustments, you know, doesn't want to like probably do index options. This is exactly uh, similar to probably protecting or hedging your portfolio, but uh, you know, with certain tweaks. So what you do in a covered call is, you know, like you go, um, say for example, let's take the one of the popular stocks. Like you have, you have Reliance in your portfolio and Reliance is trading at 2,500, 600 right now, I don't know exactly, yeah, is it trading at 2,500 right now, for example, what you do is, now stock options have only monthly expiries, so what you do is, at the beginning of the month, like in the first week or so, don't do it exactly on the first day, but after three or four days when there is decent liquidity, you can probably go calculate what 10% you know, about the current market price of Reliance would be, it's like say 2,500, 10% above it would be 2,750. Now look for the nearest liquid option. Generally in stocks, it'll be with your round figure because there's a problem of liquidity. You either go to seven double zero or you go to eight double zero. I think two eight double zero will make more sense because it's a little far away. You would get around say eight rupees, ten rupees, twenty rupees, depending on the IV. You sell that option exactly in the equivalent quantity that you have the stock. So you are selling a covered call. So in a way, you are saying that if Reliance moves up by ten percent, doesn't move up by ten percent, then I pocket the premium of ten rupees or something. And then you keep doing this exercise for the entire, you know, 12 months and you keep pocketing some premium. Okay. Now it's sounding all great right now. Okay. What happens if the stock moves, if there's a wide move? So, I mean, just like any other trades, this trade also requires some adjustment, some management. Relatively lesser because the stock moving 10% every month, practically nifty 50 stocks, very stable, you know, very behaved stocks don't move that much every month. So you should be fine in like, you know, two, three months of the year, you might have to make adjustment. So when... Uh, simply the stock moves by 10% or more. So so you need to have a system here that the moment Reliance comes in the money, like you their sold call is 2,800. The moment the price of the stock comes near 2,800, what you do is you square off that position and then you take 10% above that. That comes up to around 3,100, right? Um, yeah. 3,000. 3,050. 3, so the nearest liquid, whether it's 3,000 or 3,100, the nearest liquid option, you send the call for the next month. Next month. Now you'll get really good premiums on that because A, the stock is already bullish, so the calls are spiked. Secondly, you have, you know, like 10, 15 days, whenever you squared off the position, you have 10 days or 15 days to go. 
for the correct expiry and then you have the entire month so time is on your side so you do that you know you square off this and you know do it for the next expiry now again the same situation arises you again square that off and do it for the next expiry you are just playing a game of probability here how many times is the stock going to shoot up 20 10 percent 20 percent 30 percent see we are not talking about penny stocks or you know Mm. Or, you know, the so called operated stocks. These stocks don't move 20%, 30% that easily, right? We all know that. And if, in a rare case scenario, say you are not able to manage the trade and the stock keeps moving and you've just, you know, like lost the angle of that trade, what do you do? You give delivery of that stock because you're anyway making the same amount of money in the stock. Mm. If the stock has moved by 10, 10% or 20%, your option has given you that loss there and the same amount you made in your stocks. Mm. So you sell off the stock, get rid of the stock. You have the money in your account, go for another nifty 50 FNO stock where you can start the same exercise. Or opposite, the opposite thing of you know doing that is you start selling puts for Reliance. If you really want to buy back Reliance, then you keep that money in your account, start selling puts of 10% below, right? 10% below the current market price. Whenever it comes in the money, you buy the stock again. So these are the couple of ways and managing will do. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, covered calls can be a really safe strategy, like in terms of, there could be a notional loss, but there isn't actually a loss happening there. Like, you know, uh, either you make like 15, 17, 20% on your portfolio, which you anyway are making, and you make a little more in option premium, mm -hmm. or you still make that 15, 20%, but you just don't make that 30, 40%, like in a year where the portfolio had really spiked up and, you know, it was bullish and you missed out on that opportunity because of the loss in your options. So. There can be an opportunity cost sort of a thing that you're losing out on, you know, certain extra profit, but you're not losing money actually. So if you do this activity again for a consistent period of time, you would end up winning because an option seller has, you know, as repeated again and again, a high probability of winning. Right. So really interesting insights, Dawal. We've touched upon a lot of topics and I hope our viewers have enjoyed it. I mean, there's a lot of other things we could talk about and, you know, we could go like probably more in depth. I need to call you again for that. But for now, you know, thanks a lot for the intriguing and riveting conversation that we had. And I hope the viewers think the same about it. So thanks a lot, though. Thanks for having me.